If you're looking for a beer that's low ABV, well balanced, and easy drinking, session beers, as they're called, are perfect to brew and drink any time of year. Pick up a copy of Session Beers from Brewers Publications. Written by expert brewer Jennifer Talley, Session Beers contains 24 homebrew recipes from Allagash White to Urban Chestnut Zwickle, all under 5% ABV. Available for $19.95 at BrewersPublications.com. That's BrewersPublications.com. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, October 18th, 2018. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Ricky the Mead Maker from Groenfell Meadery in Vermont joins us to stir the pot. Metaphorically this time, Ricky talks about a blog article he's published that he says was apparently too controversial to print. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other brewing gear. Basic brewing gear, that is, including our tie-dye silicone pint. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. And if you'd do us the favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment there, they say that will help new listeners to find us. If you want to support us financially, check out Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing. Thanks to all the new subscribers who I keep seeing uh, through my email list there who are helping us out. If you go to basic brewing or uh, patreon.com slash basic brewing, uh, you can see a long list of the stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. And maybe I'll get my act together before I <laughs> as I get on with this show. I've either had not enough coffee or too much. Uh, we're planning to shoot our Halloween show featuring my booberry tart beer. There's been a lot of interest in that after seeing the pictures of it, especially on Instagram and Twitter and such. Uh, I'm gathering more examples of monster cereal homebrews uh, for an audio show that will probably not make it in time for Halloween. Uh, but it will be fun anyway. It'll be a nice uh, monster cereal beer post-Halloween special here in a few weeks. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, Lots of of fun stuff coming down the line. I uh, debuted my first batch of makgeolli, or Korean rice wine, at a little fall gathering we had this past weekend uh, here at the house. A few were bold enough to try it, and they liked it, or at least they said they did. Uh, And I have to say that I've I've already shared some with Steve, uh, Steve Wilkes of Steve's Brew Shop. I couldn't wait. (laughs) because <laughs> I knew that he would like it, and he, and he did. He said he really liked it. So it's taken me a little longer than I expected to put together a video uh, podcast about it because I'm, I'm making a second batch, uh, as I mentioned, I think last week, with uh, dry German wheat beer yeast. And um, I, I, I open up the jar and I smell it, and I swear that I smell a little bit of banana from this batch, which is what I'm hoping will happen. Um I'm hoping it'll come out like, you know, banana custard or something like that with the rice solids in there. So it's got a few days more in fermentation, then it'll be ready to bottle and sample, and then we'll we'll shoot an episode. So it may be, uh, you know, early November before we get that out. I received uh, several email messages in response to my conversation with Tommy Cayuet on making makgeolli. Uh, this one's from Nick, who says he was introduced to Makali by a Korean co-worker when he worked at a large brewery in Portland. Nick says, after some experimentation, I settled on a method where you get the conversion slash fermentation going by combining cooked rice flour, called juk, I believe, nuruk, and whatever yeast I was using. Then, over the course of a few weeks, I would feed the fermentation some steamed rice every three or four days. A pretty sake-like regimen for someone who thought sake sounded like too much work. (laughs) Uh, Nick says, I ran some tests on a delicious batch made with Lalvin D47 yeast in the brewery's QA lab. The filtered makgeolli came out to be 16.5% ABV with a final gravity of 1022 the instrument I used determined that the original gravity was approximately 1.14. So, wow. Nick says that uh, you can also use Nuruk to make soy sauce and black bean sauce. So, very cool. 
And this is from Alan in Squim, Washington, who lived in Korea for two and a half years. He says teaching English. He says it was a wonderful experience. Alan says a one-minute walk from my apartment was a mockley house where a group of foreigners would meet up every Wednesday night. I was never able to see the process of brewing, but I definitely delved into the drinking culture there. <laughs> Alan says the owner of the house would serve the makgeolli out of a refrigerator for soup, so I assumed he'd brew a batch and dump ten gallons worth into this fridge for soup. Imagine a chest freezer, but an insulated pot with a lid. He'd dip a large ladle in there and pour it into various sized brass pots. At your table, you'd pour the makgeolli from the pot into some small drinking bowls and drink with one or two hands. Uh, Alan says uh, three wi- three ways I saw it consumed: straight up in the bowl, mixed with a bit of Sprite or Seven Up, which was called cider or cida. For the hardcore old school Korean farmer slash country man or woman, soju and makgeolli mixed together. That's their eighteen to twenty one percent distilled beverage you could buy for one to two dollars at a corner store. Uh, Alan says I did that once, and that was enough. He says, "I don't know what it was about makgeolli. Maybe the moisture-sucking property of rice, but I've never experienced more severe headaches the next morning after a night at the makgeolli house." <laughs> Thanks for the warning, Alan.、Uh, I've only consumed makgeolli in very small quantities,、uh, mainly because、um, I don't have that much of it. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing I don't. Good thing to keep in mind. And finally, Nigel from Perth. In Western Australia, writes my wife is Korean, but also a Kiwi, and we both love makgeolli. Makgeolli works especially well with Korean cuisine, such as spicy stews and barbecued meat. And there are an entire range of utensils and drinkware associated with drinking it traditionally. Also, just a note on the comment of it being like lemonade: Koreans often mix makgeolli with a bit of lemonade to serve it, especially when drinking the full strength versions. Nigel says we went to Korea last year to see my wife's family, and makgeolli is sold in most restaurants. It was really interesting to see the regional variations as we traveled around the country. In the northeast of the country, they often have makgeolli made with a blend of rice and corn. We also went to a bar in Seoul that specialized in makgeolli and tried a bunch of different kinds, including ones with fruit, corn, sweet potatoes, and chestnuts. Very cool. Thanks everybody who、uh, wrote in on makgeolli.、Uh, I know we're just scratching the surface, as I often say, and we've got a lot to learn. So I'm, I'm looking forward to my next next batch of beer, or should I say batches, that I'm planning to、uh, brew with my electric brew in a bag system from our friends and sponsors Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. I'm going to do a 10 gallon batch next time. And I'm going to split it into two fermenters, fermenting one half in my basement where it's a little cooler. And the other half using the high gravity system to ferment at around 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 C. It's a pretty extreme difference in temperature, but this is a fun yeast that I'll be using, and it'll, it'll be easy to maintain the higher temp with the Word Hog controller. I'll just、uh, have to put some water in the kettle, put the colander type insert in there, and then put the carboy in and set the controller to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 C、uh, in the mash mode. And、uh, just as I've done, you know, when I've kettle soured beers in there, I could just walk away and wait for the yeast to do its thing. If it were summer, I'd put the fermenter out on the porch. But f- finally, the outside temperatures are dropping here, so try that trick with your propane system or your bread machine type electric system.、Uh, high gravity electric brewing takes the pain out of propane with their awesome Word Hog controllers, with systems from five gallons all the way up to two barrels. Brewing season is here. Get into it right by going to highgravitybrew.com. Use the code EBC seventy five BB to save seventy five bucks off your electric brewing purchase. Highgravitybrew.com. Okay, Ricky the Mead Maker is a longtime friend of the podcast. First appearing way back in two thousand nine when he was a rebellious home brewer. Now he's a rebellious professional mead maker at Groenfell Meadery, and host of the Ask the Mead Maker. Program on YouTube. He says he submitted an article called "Making Craft Mead at Home in Less Than Three Weeks" to three print publications, and it was deemed too controversial to print. You can find that article on Groenfell.com. But Ricky wanted to come on the show to get kind of philosophical, 
to ask why we get so worked up about brewing stuff when we should just be relaxing and having a homebrew. Ricky the Mead Maker, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. It's great to be here. So what's been up? We talked in February of 2017, I believe, the last time. What's What's been happening? Tons of things. So there's been like huge changes in the mead world, which may or may not interest your listeners. Uh, we have a baby now, uh, the Viking baby. She gets to be on TV about every six months because being a small child who belongs to a brewer is news by Vermont standards. <laughs> and... Uh, and the reason we're talking today is, as many of your listeners may know, we're an open source company. We give all of our recipes away for free, our techniques. And I was asked to write a big, long article about how we brew. And I submitted it to the magazine. And about three months later, after bugging them, they said they couldn't publish it because it was too controversial. And... I got it back and I said, you know, what's too controversial about it? And they said, you know, oh, this, that, and the other people will be upset. And I think I emailed you about a month after that saying, you know, how did this happen? I wasn't, first of all, we're not talking politics here. We're not talking big commercial things that are controversial. I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners know that right now some of the big breweries are suing uh, over the independent craft logo. Hmm which is just ludicrous, this idea that it's preventing people from making an honest choice. And, uh, you know, alcohol has always had issues, like on the commercial level, from prohibition to the mob involvement to it's a lot of rent-seeking. Uh, people use legislation to keep small guys out of markets. But, like, that is not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about things that are, like, on a on a professional or international level legal level duplicitous we're just talking about things like you know we ferment slightly hotter than other people and for a hobby that literally started with relax and have a homebrew i wanted your take on how did we become so heated <laughs> we are fermenting hotter ourselves is that what you're saying something like that and so i got to thinking about it i i don't know if you know, my background is in uh, philosophy and liberal religious traditions. And it's just fascinated me watching this hobby. I worked in a homebrew shop for five years. And periodically, people would come in and, you know, we'd say, well, you just buy one of the homebrew kits. You know, they've got the grain in there. They've got malt extract. It's got everything you need. And it would be like telling someone, I'm sorry, Catholicism is incorrect. You need to abandon it. <laughs> they would look at us and, you know, I am an all grain brewer. And I would look back and go, so am I. You know, I, I, I was at that point already starting to go pro in, in <laughs> as a professional brewer. I was like, I'm not, I'm not telling you the way you're doing it is wrong. But you asked me, can you make a batch of beer in less than half an hour? And my answer is yes. And then you got mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think people people have their opinions and they stick to them. And I, I remember back when uh, I was first selling the DVDs before the podcast and I was making cold calls to uh, homebrew shops around the country and sending them sample DVDs. And they would you know eventually watch it and some would buy the, buy the DVDs and some wouldn't. And I talked to one homebrew shop owner, and he said, uh, look, "You know, your DVD is is all right, but you tell people that uh, they should they can use iota for to sanitize things, and uh, I don't tell people." I, I, he said, "I can taste iota for in every single batch of beer that has had it, and therefore uh -huh. I'm not going to sell your DVD." Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> and what we used to tell people, I, I was very lucky. I worked at a homebrew shop in Iowa and uh, I was beer crazy. I love to promote these guys. I have no no vested interest in them other than it's where I learned the vast majority of what I learned. And one of the things that the owner used to say is that there are three things you will hear. You will hear facts. You will hear things that are broadly supported by the evidence we have and then you will hear opinions masquerading as facts and that represents 80 percent of the brewing community 
And, and I just and, thought this was the, and in defense yeah. in defense of iota four before yes. we move too far along. Yeah. If you use it properly, and you know if it is, it is diluted properly, you don't taste it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would have kids come in and, you know, we'd try to sell them star sand or iota for or whatever. And inevitably someone would go, you know, you can just water down bleach. And we'd say, you sure can. Or <laughs> pennies more. You could use a food grade sanitizer that when watered down to correct proportions, in some cases, you can drink. Like PBW, you can, at, at proper dilution, it won't kill you. You won't have a great day. It will <laughs> kill you. And I was like, why? Not, not recommended, by the way, for legal not reasons. <laughs> anyone on this podcast, me or James. Um, but, you know, we'd say, why? I mean, you're saving yourselves pennies on a hobby where you've just purchased from us a $145 pot that you're going to use once a month. It's it's just not where you should be scrimping and saving. Now, and again, it, go ahead. Now, uh, when I first started doing the podcast, it was a regular occurrence that I would get emails, you know, every week. Oh, you said to do this. Uh, that's not right. You, you shouldn't tell people to do that. Now, I think as time goes on, that might have softened a bit because of the Internet and because of people doing experiments and, you know, especially, you know, in, like the experimental brewing guys and brewlosophy and, you know, people are doing experiments or posting things and people are trying to like. So it it may be getting better. I think it is. Actually, um, someone I want to throw a shout out to, Michael Tonsmeyer, a mutual friend of ours, uh, the mad fermentationist. I think he moved the whole idea that your hobby could be like a sport could just be constant experimenting a long way. And I think the issue, and we talk about this a lot on my show and when people come to the mead hall, we sponsor a lot of homebrew events. We say that there is a single problem driving all of this. The idea that you can do it right, hmm. that there is a correct way. And so I have an, I think I have an article. I know I talk about it a lot on my YouTube channel that when people go, you know, will I get off flavors? And the whole idea, what is an off flavor? An off flavor is a flavor you don't want. So the example I use is we have a product uh, called Psychopomp. It's a, it's a partially wild fermented cherry mead. And we ferment it hot, like hot, 94 Sometimes, depending on the time of year, we won't get into the, the nuances, but, you know, 96 degrees Fahrenheit. And people say, well, won't you get off flavors? But I go, well, if we brew it that way every time and we get a consistent batch every time, we're not getting off flavors. If we're getting the mead, we want. And uh, just last week, someone shared something on Facebook about one of my recipes, and I don't. I, I technically have access to Facebook. Uh, I like to say I'm part of the slow Twitter movement that if I <laughs> want something to go on the internet, I have to give it to someone on my staff and he or she will go put it on the internet for me. But another professional mead maker said, did you hear that someone was singing your praises online? So he sent me a link and I went and I found it and it started out by someone harassing sort of like a fictional version of me um, based on, a fermentation temperature, which is something I'd, I'd love to talk with you about in a minute. And the three responses were, one, you know, I've never had this guy's mead, but he seems to sell a lot of it. <laughs> I thought that was a good position to take on it. Number two was, well, everyone's got different tastes. And the third one was, I've had it. And this is why I love so much. He goes, it's not for me, but there's nothing wrong with it. Hmm. And I thought that was the best position because I'm not a huge sour beer fan, but I have a really close friend in the industry who that is all their brewery does is sours. And I love to taste this stuff and go, you know what? Glad you gave this to me. I'm going to finish the glass you gave me, but I will never buy this at the supermarket, man. And I have two products that he feels the exact same way about. You know, they just they have a little bit more sweetness than he likes in a mead or perceived sweetness. They actually have no residual sugar. But I get it. Uh, Kelly, my wife, who owns the brewery, she doesn't love all of our meads because two of them present as sweet. So I think that's part of the issue is when you let your personal tastes 
get in the way of, you know, is this an effective brewing process? And when you have this idea that there's a right way to do it, you know, I, you're a BJCP judge, right? No. Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, good. Me neither. I dropped out of the program. But, you know, I only pretend is, I have credentials. Right? <laughs> I don't even I do that. Special box now. Can you imagine that after all these years? It's weird. But one of the things they say is never guess. You know, never say this beer was really good, but it would be better if you did it all grain. Because dollars to donuts, you're tasting an all grain batch. And this idea that all grain is better or any one of these things I, I tell people over and over, there's one customer I have who makes sour meads. And the first one he made, it was not on purpose, but he really liked it. And so he stopped using, you know, sulfiting in the initial fermentation. He's frankly stopped using what I would consider safe uh, sanitization protocols for his equipment, but that's fine. He only makes mead. He's not making beers and uh, he's loving it. More power to them. They all taste like they have lemon zest in them. <laughs> and But if if you're making what you want, that's sort of the end of it. And if your friends don't like it, good, more beer for you. Yeah. But yeah. I, so I did, I, I, I didn't tell you before, before we got on this call, I looked it up um, in a sociology book I have. Apparently, this is what hobbies have been since at least the 1970s, possibly 1960s, when people started tracking it. Hobbies are where people sort of got it out of their system. <laughs> so there's a term which you you may have heard, which is narcissism of minor differences. And basically what it means is that if you are uh, – let's avoid politics completely. Great example. I used to live in Denmark. And the Danes make fun of the Swedes all the time. The Swedes make fun of the Danes and the Norwegians, and the Norwegians make fun of the Danes constantly. But they never make fun of anyone from Spain or England because there's no reason. They're too, they're too distant. Basically, the Danes, the Swedes, and the Norwegians are all – I should be off the record for this, but I'm not going to – they're all the same country. <laughs> you know, like, they're the same people. They all speak the same language. They have all more or less, they share their power grid, right? Like these people are basically the same country. So they have to go through all this work of saying, no, 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 no. I'm not Norwegian. I'm Danish because I, I put mayonnaise on my hot dogs, but those heretics, they put salsa on their hot dogs. And yeah, you know, I, I mean, there's an entire cookbook that just catalogs these nuanced differences, but like between the gravies of Norway and the gravies of Sweden. And I don't know how many people own this cookbook. I do. Um, but that's been hobbies for years. So I think that as politics has become more diversive, people are using their hobbies more and more to say, no, 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 you nut job. You should never make a sour beer in a carboy and then use it for something else. Or, you, or kettle souring is, is uh, heretical. <laughs> yes, we don't love kettle souring on our list. Can we jump into the things that yes. between the two of us we have heard over the years people get so up in arms about and see if you have or I have an opinion on them? Uh, first one on the list is something that you and I talked about, God, like four years ago when I visited you in Arkansas for seven, seven, long time ago. Whew. It's got to be a long time ago because uh, I wasn't a pro yet. Um, brew in the bag. Let's talk about brew in the bag. Yeah, I, I think it's as most things when over time they become more accepted, the more that they are proven to work. Uh, and I think I think that, uh, you know, as people kind of sort of uh, the resistance falls away as people, you know, know people who brew in the bag and make good beer. They <laughs> then they start to say, well, maybe it's not so bad after a little while. But then, you know, when you say I brew in the bag and then I squeeze the bag after I, you know, as I'm collecting the wort, then, you know, then their hackles get up again. <laughs> That's what I was going to bring up. So, um, oh, the tannins, tannins. I don't have tannins in mead making, but, oh, tannin extraction from husks. I've, I ever have to get in a conversation about tannin extractions from husks again. It's brew in the bag, people. 
And it's people who stir their mash during laudering. Oh, I, 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 I stir during the mash. Yep, stirring. You're you're gonna just ruin your beer, James. <laughs> I bet you never made a good batch ever <laughs> because of stirring. <laughs> well, I, I haven't done a side by side. I just know that <laughs> I get I, I get better efficiency when I stir the mash. And that's that's the one that it's all about your goals, right? Um, so we have a couple on our list here that are about about efficiencies. Uh, one thing that definitely nobody in the homebrewing world is doing but is getting hackles up in the commercial world is there's a new technique where people mill their grain into flour do you know about this uh no but uh you the show that i just posted this past week was about an experiment or actually what what is today thursday yeah i posted it yesterday was with a, a home brewer brooke baber who may, sent me some beers, uh, of which a major part of the the grain bill was rye or wheat flour or rye flour. That's amazing. And they were they were delicious beers, and you know what? They were crystal clear. Uh huh. So I can't remember who it is, and even if I could remember, I probably shouldn't bring it up on air. But there is this really cool technology in the commercial world where to get maximum efficiency, and we're talking efficiencies above 98% extraction here. Wow. Um, full conversions, full extractions, they are using an osmotic filter to extract the sugars and other constituents out, and they're just basically using a varied medium to pull different flavors out of flour. And the whole thing is done using a vacuum evacu evacuator. Hmm. And uh, I was talking to one of my friends up here who owns a brewery literally down the street from me. And she just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Just She just thought it was so cool. She could never afford it, you know, for it being the size they are. But it's really cool technology. And the brewery that I believe does it is is national. I mean, almost everyone listening has either heard of or had their beer at some point. And here we have this sort of mixed. So if you could make beer using 25% less resources, almost everyone would prefer that. Beer is a huge waste of resources when you come to think of it. But then you hear that they're using this experimental technology and everyone's up in arms again. <laughs> and what's crazy about this brewery is that they transitioned from traditional mashing in to using this technology and didn't tell anybody. Uh. And nobody noticed the difference. It was only after the fact that they started coming at them. Oh, I could tell on, you know, that batch in March. It, it had and then, you know, everyone had a different opinion about what was wrong about it. But I, I just think our entire – my industry and everyone who's listening, your hobby came from people pushing the envelope. And it cracks me up anytime there's this new technique. But as you said, yes, Brew in the Bag finally got accepted. And I, I'm, I think that's mostly because of you and the nation of Australia. <laughs> and, uh, new Zealand's been pushing the envelope. Every time there's some cool new thing, uh, it seems to come out of New Zealand in the home brewing world. Um, it's just me and the Aussies. <laughs> you and the Aussies. I actually heard your band years ago. So it's not. It's not bad. Steve's the drummer. Um, James and the Aussies. Well, I, I can't. Um, I, I can't take that much credit for any for anything yeah. in the world, <laughs> except for um, except for maybe my 15 minute pale ale uh, technique, yeah, uh, which I came yes. out with a few years ago. Uh, and I, it, the, the, it was right as we first started because we went to the homebrew conference in June of 2006. It was down in Orlando, and it was the first time I'd ever met Charlie Papazian. And I said, I've got this beer in the fermenter, and I only boiled it for 15 minutes. It's an, it's an extract beer, and I only boiled it for 15 minutes. What do you think it's going to turn out like? And he was like, well, I don't know. I just, you know, that was just like brand new stuff. Uh -huh. uh, and he doesn't. He didn't know what to think about that because it was just like you didn't do things like that. Yep. Uh, turns out, turns out it makes good beer. In fact, the beer yes, that I've it got does. on I've made many of them myself. I, the the beer that I've got on tap right now is a no boil extract beer. 
that I just brought. I put the extract in the uh, water, you know, mixed up my wort, brought it just up to boiling, shut off the heat, and added, you know, three and a half ounces of assorted hops and let it sit there for, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes. I can't remember now. I don't have my notes. And then cooled it down and pitched the yeast. And it's a, it's a tasty beer. Right. And once it's extracted, they've already gone through the work for you. So let's jump to sours. <laughs> Speaking of. So the biggest one, the first article that I ever wrote, they got some serious traction. Again, in New Zealand, actually. Lots of shares in New Zealand. Christchurch is the... Uh, the location on Google Maps that still has read this article more than anywhere else. Sterilizing your must when making mead. Mm. So the article was called Them is Fighting Words. <laughs> and it was about it's it's technically it's three camps. There's the boil camp, and I'm gonna call the boil camp the heating camp. So some of them say bring it up to 165. Some say bring it to a full boil. There's the no heat camp, and then there's the no heat, no sulfites camp. So in mead making, you almost always heat your water just a little bit because cold honey, cold water don't like to mix with each other. Mm -hmm. um, though an award-winning mead up here in New England was made uh, by a guy who had 20 pounds of honey in the bottom of a like a 10-gallon pail uh, years old and it was just a solid mass and he poured water on top of it and kept sprinkling yeast onto the top of it of his batch open the bucket every couple days and just sprinkle another old package of yeast out of his fridge onto the top of it and slowly over time that water honey layer at the bottom got eaten up by the yeast and he aged it for three years, no nutrients, no heating, no mixing, and won awards for three years in a row with the exact same batch. <laughs> so it can be done. Full disclosure, wouldn't recommend it at home. Um, it would suck if you if it took three years to make really you know something really bad, really bad. <laughs> um, so in mead making, this is it. This is this is the creme de la creme of fights. You heat your mead up to 185 degrees and you'll have teeth knocked out, you know? <laughs> and so this is one of those funny cases where science comes to bear on it. You know, there are facts mixed in with this fight. So one of the things that makes mead making special is uh, honey has a higher number of easily volatized, low temperature volatized chemicals than several other beverages, though white wines have the same number. There's a reason we don't boil our white wines to sterilize them before fermentation. When you heat honey up, you are, if you smell it in the air during the brew day, that is an aroma that will not be in your final product. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's just fact. If you can smell it now, it's not going to fall back into the bucket. But this comes down to an issue where I make craft meat. So everything I make is below 9% alcohol. It's all carbonated. And as a percentage of the final product, the total honey is much smaller than, say, someone uh, who makes a honey wine in the 15% region with residual sugar. So I have a batch of meat that uses literally one quarter of the amount of honey that some of the sweeter products commercially available on the market use. That means that I have 25% as much volatile compound in my initial batch. Mm. So we would never heat that high. But if you've got the aroma to lose, go for it. It all matters what your end product is going to be. But yep. then the entire idea of sulfites Oh uh, yeah, you you have you must have something to say about heating. Well, I guess it, it all, as you said, you know, it all boils down, so to speak. To yeah. the, <laughs> to, Not to acknowledging the, that. Keep going. I didn't mean to do that. Yeah. <laughs> to uh, it, it, I've just I've just been a dad so long. I can't help it. Yep. Uh, it all uh, comes down to uh, the final product. I mean, it does does the final product taste good? 
Could it taste better if you changed your way of doing things? And have you experimented with changing the, your way of doing things to see if it makes it better? Right. And then there are the ones that just have a lot of misinformation around them, like sulfites. People think they get sulfite headaches. I'm not going to be the person to say you're wrong. Uh, go to the Internet. Go to Wikipedia. Uh, there is no such thing as a sulfite headache. Uh, it's the same as MSG headaches. It's a, a fiction. Um, but this whole idea. So we experimented on a major scale. I mean, we're talking uh, I probably 18,000 gallons worth of experimentation. Um, on no uh, sulfiting of the meat. Hmm. You know, that's, that, those are big batches to risk to wild fermentation getting in there because we use only raw honey. So the honey we get has never been pasteurized. It's coming with a whole load. And we are probably moving back towards some form of sanitizing that or sterilizing the must before we pitch our yeast but it has nothing to do with them being bad batches. Um, some of our best batches on record came during this period. But for me, it's a question of commercial viability. You know, how consistent is my product? And I'll say, I had a big change of heart on this. In our early articles, we always recommended doing something to sanitize your must, uh, just for consistency's sake. But as I've continued to homebrew alongside my commercial making, I'm, I'm all about irregularity in my homebrew batches. Hmm. That's the fun of it. Another thing, uh, speaking of sterilization, that there's a lot of science behind uh, is – have you talked about this on air? I haven't heard uh, – pasteurizing individual bottles. We actually did an experiment. Tim Lieber uh, shared an experiment uh, – at uh, HomebrewCon, where he actually did uh, a pasteurize using a sous vide system, pasteurized mm -hmm. uh, individual bottles of mead. That's fascinating. How'd it go? It worked because right. he he did a side by side. Uh, one uh, one turned out to be a still mead, and one turned out to be a sparkling mead because the one that he didn't pasteurize actually had a little more activity in it, and so it. It carbonated a little bit, which proves that the pasteurization did work. Yes. And that's the other question. When you don't do side-by-sides, how do you know? <laughs> um, when you're like, oh, this batch was so much better. Um, yeah. Yep. Maybe maybe you had had one fewer of uh, James' famous 15-minute uh, pale ales before <laughs> brewing. <laughs> Now, now, one thing, one thing that you said, you know, since you are a commercial uh, meadery, uh, there are some things that you probably do that you don't do when you're home brewing, just as an insurance policy, because yep. you don't want thousands or whatever the number is of cans of a batch of mead going out the door that all of a sudden start bulging and spraying in people's faces and you know oh you mean the, the 8642 cans of root of all evil that i had to recall two years ago and then <laughs> reopen every single one of by hand um <laughs> yep yep uh oh I, I i don't know if i've it's it's my biggest rookie mistake of all time i so i consulted in the brewing world before i went pro myself which is really helpful because i learned a lot of other people's screw-ups but Beer breweries would never have this problem, so didn't didn't come across it. Uh, Rid of all evil is our ginger mead, and uh, yes, it should be rhizome of all evil. But why let botanical accuracy get in the way of a good pun? <laughs> and uh, it has lemon and ginger in it. And usually, uh, as I said, open source company, you can go online and read all this in much greater detail. But we brew a batch of mead because ginger, again, has uh, fairly high volatilization rates. We don't put it in the initial fermentation. We put it in post-fermentation. And because we're already opening up the tank to add the ginger, that's when we put the lemon in. Usually we get about seven days. Uh, it's a 6.9% alcohol beverage. So it ferments down. We get it chilled. We put the ginger and lemon in and off to the races. Well, the problem is... We chill it usually just to get some of the yeast to precipitate out, but it's still about 65 to 70 degrees. 
well, we were in a rush. Mm. And I had it already chilled to carbonation temperatures, 30, in our case, 31 degrees Fahrenheit. And I put the ginger and lemon in, and two days later, we packaged it. Well, the lemon juice, you don't think about this, but of course, it has sugar in it. So as soon as they came up to room temperature, all the, the sugar in the lemon juice was enough to make our can start popping. Oof. And just total, I'd always put it in while the batch was still warm. And this one time I didn't. So at this point, even we just put out a batch yesterday that read 998 on package day for Final Gravity. We still saw Fight and Sorbate. Just, <laughs> it, I just, I'm never again. 8,642 cans all opened at sub freezing temperatures. Um, never again. So one of my employees first day actually. There's an opening can, and he still works for me. This is about to say something about my company. But yeah, pasteurizing bottles is something that I had heard all this achada about. And I was like, well, there there are two questions here. One, does it work? Sounds like it does. And two, does it spoil your beer? And again, only way to know this is side-by-side tests. Now, the, the we did a side-by-side tasting. Yes. And the uh, the pasteurized mead was not s- spoiled in any way. It didn't have any off flavors. It didn't darken, or you know, there was there was nothing wrong with it. We did enjoy, however, kind of ironically, we did uh, enjoy the one that had the little more activity in it because it was more it was more bright. Yeah, brighter. That had, is actually yeah. carbonation. It had a little bit of mm-hmm. you know uh, acidity to it because of the you know the carbon dioxide in there, and and we liked it better. Yep. So you know, uh, but the fact is you know that the heating that mead in the bottle, you know, didn't didn't damage it essentially. Yep. Um, I have two more that I want to get to before we're done, but I also have to tell you there's a. Uh, thing in our industry that they do especially for um nitro beverages where they will pasteurize them after canning so to completely eliminate any activity things like uh nitro coffees but the problem is so think of a commercial facility you know they're coming out of the canning machine they go god it seems like a quarter mile down a line into this heating chamber but nitro is six volumes of CO2 or the equivalent of six volumes of CO2 and cans aren't really rated for that. Mm. So they'll start exploding on the line <laughs> through the heating apparatus. But by the time the first can explodes because the nitro level is too high, you have this like hundred cans that has already been packaged at that pressure. And then you, you I've seen it. I won't say where someone literally run from one end of the line to the other and say, drop your nitro levels. <laughs> and then you just can after can after can after can explode until the ones with the new levels come through. Yeah. Uh, I've done a nitro meet and I I've done exactly one and I don't think I'll ever do it again. And this is partially why they actually test them by throwing them against a wall uh. to see if, if they'll explode and hurt anyone. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> So the two I want to talk about, and one I have very clear thoughts on, force carbonating. Come on. It, if you could have your beer ready two weeks earlier, I don't care if there is any perceived difference. And I don't think there is compared to naturally carbonating, mind you. But I am such an advocate of just doing it as efficiently as possible. Once you have a keg system... Why go through the rigmarole of possibly overcarbonating? Because that's always the risk of naturally carbonating things. And I like naturally carbonated, but not if it's that much less efficient. Thoughts? Well, and and plus, I mean, are you talking just on the homebrew scale or the or the? Or... Because when you're in your commercial, it's a whole different ball game. Because then you can, you know, it's a marketing ploy. Well, plus you you. Uh... You know, when you bottle condition or or can condition or whatever, you're going to have sediment in the bottom of the you know in the bo- bottom of the vessel, and that's going to uh, you know so most consumers are not going to like that uh, on right. the commercial side. Yep. Uh, but I don't know if you I, do. You think it makes a difference? I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I think you get. You, 
Well, I don't know. You could argue either way. You say you, you, one might say that you get more control over forest carbonating, but on the other side, you can adjust the amount of priming sugar that you put, say, in your bottles. Uh, you know, to to compensate for that. Uh, I think if we want to put it down to kegs versus bottles, mm-hmm. I still do both. Yep. And I, you know, uh, Steve Wilkes does not keg and does not want to get into kegging. He just, he, he loves bottling. Who uh, loves bottling? <laughs> I think I have an article out uh, from a couple of years ago called, literally called Bottling is the Worst. Well, you know, I... It, it's meditative. It, when I, But whenever I keg, uh, I'm pretty particular on how I clean my kegs and mm-hmm. sanitize my kegs. And I, I haven't timed it. I haven't done a, a side-by-side comparison. But I swear that it feels like I spend as much time on on kegging as I do bottling. That's that's fair. Be- um, because I I wash bottles usually just a few at a time. You know, when I use them, I rinse them out so that they're stable. Uh, and then when I get a few, you know, like maybe a case, I'll wash them. And it'll take maybe, what, 30 minutes yep. to, to wash bottles. And then on, on bottling day, I put all the bottles in the dishwasher with no soap and yep. put it on the high heat wash cycle and the high high heat dry cycle and those bottles get up to 175 degrees fahrenheit and stay that way for 10 to 15 minutes so uh <laughs> fair enough so i i have a a video out uh which you probably haven't seen yet it came out just a couple of weeks ago called biggest stenanks and stenank is a made up word from a a cartoon that i watch where this guy refuses to admit that he makes mistakes <laughs> uh, he'd prefer to call them stenanks. And um, I talk about I had a bottling run before we switched to canning where the capper mechanism came down and the bottle, bottles were misaligned and it crushed them mm. with 128 PSI head pressure. And the bottles blew up in such a way that they blew bottles off of both ends of the machine from the concussive force of oh. the explosion. Uh, so that's actually what I was referencing when I said bottling is the worst. <laughs> nobody <laughs> nobody got a shard of glass embedded in them, but they could have. Um, but yeah. you know, no, I just I feel like force carbonating is the last refuge of the irate. Um, when, when you find out that some home brewer, you know, kegs and then bottles a couple off of taps and you're like oh i could tell because the carb level was lower and i'm like they also have taps at their house man i mean they're living the dream and you can you can oh. also spend more money and get a you know like a counterflow or or what what yep. are they, the blickman beer gun or whatever the yep. you know yep. the counter pre- actually, counter pressure bottle filler is what it is i have a batch that i filled entirely that way uh again bottling sucks um <laughs> but that was my fault, not not Blickman. He's he's a very nice young man. <laughs> um, he's twenty five years older than I am. Um, he's so, young young at heart. Okay, so here's my last one that I didn't want to miss: white sugar. So, <laughs> when you're making an IPA, and you want those hops to pop, I say. Throw a pound of white sugar into the boil. Oh, and not say corn sugar. Or corn sugar, it's fine too. It's white. Um, but you're not you're a like, sugar you're racist. Like, you're like you know? table sh- table sugar is fine. Table sugar is fine. Corn sugar is fine in the boil. Uh, basically, we can get into the the appreciation of sucrose versus fructose by yeast that's not what i want to talk about just throw in an adjunct sugar to get yourself an imperial ipa and people go that's all wrong and i'd say well you know some of the most popular ipas in the world use honey and as far as the yeast is concerned honey is table sugar well i'm not i'm not sure what vinnie trilorzo uses uh uh for his uh pliny uh, the elder uh, but I, the, there is it. But there is sugar in there because it, there's it, a sugar addition, and it's the big difference. So this is this is opinion, not fact. 
I feel that an Imperial IPA is higher ABV, but not as much malt versus a double IPA where everything is doubled. That is not an official definition. But, you know, I'm up in, I'm in, up in alchemist world. You know, that's where uh, theoretically, and I, I'm good friends with both of the owners. I actually sort of on a bunch of like water quality for brewer boards with Jen Kimmick from the alchemist. Um, but they, Hetty Topper is a great beer. It is a great beer, and they do not throw white sugar in. If I had access to Pliny on tap, I don't know that I would necessarily be drinking Hetty Topper. Hmm. Well, and and it's just a, it's just a matter of of math because you the more malt that you put into a batch, the more residual sugars are going to be left over, uh, yep. and they just add up over time. And if you don't yeah. do something to counteract that you're going to have a syrupy beer. Yep, and I know people that argue, well, just use a champagne yeast to finish it off, and that is perfectly valid. That is a that is a great solution. Um, or, because also extract efficiency goes down as ABV goes up, or, or, you know, original gravity goes up, you could save yourself a lot of money by dumping a couple cups full of white sugar in there. Yeah. Well, and yep. just, you know, the the Belgians know a little bit about adding sugar uh-huh. to beer. <laughs> and, and talk, talk about marketing things. Where, oh, it's invert sugar. Uh-huh. You heated it first. That's cool. <laughs> it just cracks me up. That, that was the one. That was the one. To this day, uh, people still bring it up. And, you know, imagine in, in my realm, if I tried to release a mead that was 75% honey and 25% white sugar. And put that right on the packaging. I'd probably go out of business. And I'd point out that I once got a batch of honey that due to environmental stress on the bees in the region of Canada we get our honey from, it came at SRM4. Basically, it was a 650-pound block of white sugar. Huh. It was just – it was such low water that from package date – to ship date to us, I think it was uh, six weeks total. It had already crystallized. Wow! Fully. Wow! It was just just environmental stressors. They produced more sugar for hive stability over the winter, and basically, we had a batch where we were trying to ferment white sugar, and it was horrible. It's actually why we one of the reasons we switched our honey supplier it was not his fault. It was just stress on the bees. But if I made a batch where I just threw white sugar in. People will be all up in arms, and I don't understand it. It's it's not cheating the system if it's for a reason. But yeah, I urge any of your listeners, because I'm not going to do it because I don't have time to homebrew mead. I do enough commercial brewing of mead. I homebrew beer and wine and sake, which I always regret every time I start a batch of sake. You, you um, should try Makali. Should I? T- you'll tell me more about it when we're off air. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's just, it's it's been my one for years. Every time I am in some capacity, I spoke at the homebrew conference a couple years ago, and you know, anytime I'm talking to people who are making IPAs, and you know, I used to advise people who were making what are now very famous IPAs, and I'd say, eh, grab yourself a bag of white sugar from Costco, see what that does. <laughs> and it comes back to the very first thing we were talking about is. Most of my top rated IPAs when I was a beer brewer, they had honey, white sugar, or corn sugar in them. And if it's the results you're after, why get in a fight? Well, let me let me ask you a question. Please do. Ricky, do, do you feel better? I do. I feel so much better. <laughs> Getting this off my chest. I can't wait for everyone to read my super controversial article. <laughs> it's uh, it's available on our web- website. Uh, it's grunfell.com. I'm sure you'll have a link somewhere. Spell it, spell uh, it for us. G-R-O-E, N as in Nancy, N as in Nancy, F as in Frank, E-L-L dot com. Uh, for my old Norse-speaking fans out there, uh, it just means Vermont uh, in Old Norse. Green mountain you know but uh yeah go read the article nothing in there i reread it i thought i might have been a jerk um i'm not (laughs) i just i just listed what we do and uh 
I hope you'll be as upset as the publishers of those magazines. <laughs> well, all the best to Kelly and your, you. your and your beautiful daughter. Thank you. Uh, do you release the name of your daughter? Well, just, uh, so her name is Nora. Um, on air, she's usually referred to as the Viking baby. Uh, <laughs> she, she has her own low, lower third on uh, the ABC station up here. Um, but yeah, she gets to be on TV about every six months with me. Uh, whenever I wake up early, she wakes up early and Kelly doesn't want to, uh, watch her for the day. (laughs) Well, all the best. And we can't, I, I, I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you so much, James. Well, thanks again to Ricky. Always fun to get together. And you can find Ricky's article, which is full of good practical mead making tips, uh, controversial though some may find them on the blog at groenfell.com, G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L.com. And I'll also post a link to it in the uh, description of this episode on basicbringradio.com. we got a couple of uh, hardcore science episodes coming up in the next couple of weeks. We're going to talk about immersion chiller flow rates and the effect of wort density and temperature of wort on IBUs in beer. Very cool. So prepare to get your science hats on. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our logbooks where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. Also, take a look at our silicone pints. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website, Provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.